On December 6, 1907, the most deadly mine disaster in U.S. history occurred when an explosion killed 361 men and boys in a West Virginia coal mine owned by the Fairmount Corporation. The earth shook as far as eight miles away, knocking people and horses off their feet. Frantic women spent days searching through the wreckage for their loved ones. In the words of one witness, their shrieks of agony were not to move the hardest heart to sorrow. At the time of the disaster, the American coal industry was only half a century old, yet had already killed and crippled more men than during any battle of the Civil War. Accident rates in American mines were double that of Germany, three times that of England, and four times that of France. Workers were fighting back, and gains were being made. In its 2003 American Labor History theme study, the U.S. National Park Service recognized that strike activity from the time period was not just motivated by economic concerns. It also involved freedom from industrial feudalism, freedom from the terrorism inflicted by hired gunmen, and the struggle for liberties promised in the Bill of Rights. In 1912, coal miners in Kanawha County, West Virginia, issued a list of demands, including a shorter workday, the right to organize, recognition of a worker's constitutional rights to free speech and assembly, an end to the blacklisting of union organizers, and alternatives to company stores. Their requested pay raise would have cost the company 15 cents per miner per day. Instead of negotiating, the company hired a private militia to break the strike. The Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency had become notorious throughout the region for using violence to prevent union organizing. 300 private detectives arrived and began evicting families from their homes, forcing the miners to set up a tent colony at Holly Grove. In July, the Irish immigrant and labor activist Mother Jones arrived to show her support. Jones had been declared the most dangerous woman in America due to her success in organizing workers. A decade earlier, she led a children's march from Philadelphia to the hometown of President Theodore Roosevelt, demanding an end to child labor. In Kanawha County, Jones persuaded more workers to join the strike. Along with Frank Keeney of the United Mine Workers, she then arranged a march of 3,000 miners to the state capital in Charleston, where she read the Declaration of Independence. The miners saw themselves as industrial slaves, and they were ready to rebel against their masters. On July 26th, strikers attacked Baldwin Feltz agents in the town of Mucklow. Four guards and 12 strikers were killed. The state government declared martial law. Attacks against miners in Kanawha by both police and private security forces were routine and often deadly. In February, a posse led by the local sheriff, Bonner Hill, drove a heavily armored train nicknamed the Bull Moose Special toward the tent colony at Holly Grove, then opened fire with a machine gun. One man was killed and over a dozen wounded. A few days later, another police raid killed several men. Mother Jones was arrested on February 13th and charged in military court. Refusing to recognize the court's jurisdiction, she was convicted of incitement to riot and conspiracy to commit murder. Her sentence, 20 years in the state penitentiary.
As winter set in, conditions in the tent colony grew increasingly dire. At least a dozen men died from starvation. In March, West Virginians elected a new governor. He took a more conciliatory approach, freeing 30 minors held under martial law statutes and transferring Mother Jones to Charleston for medical treatment. She was released after 85 days. The strikers were forced to accept a settlement under threat of deportation from the state. Some workers continued to fight for another six months. According to a later study by the Senate's Committee on Education and Labor, about 50 violent deaths had occurred during the Paint Cabin Creek strike, mostly workers. Yet no reforms resulted. Even as the mining of coal drove the American economy to new heights, the men and boys who removed it from the ground were considered expendable. Similar events would take place eight years later when striking miners in Matewan, West Virginia were subjected to a series of assaults by Baldwin Felt detectives employed by the Stone Mountain Coal Company. Workers and their families were evicted from their homes, while union organizers were blacklisted and beaten. Events came to a head when Mate One's police chief, Sid Hatfield, made the rare move of siding with the workers against the company. A gunfight broke out, killing seven detectives and three townsmen. In 1921, Hatfield was charged with dynamiting a coal tipple, an allegation most miners considered fraudulent. As he ascended the courthouse steps with his deputy, Ed Chambers, both men were gunned down in cold blood. At the time, the United Mine Workers were facing setbacks. Though they had successfully organized much of West Virginia, the southern coal fields remained entirely in the control of corporations. 80% of mines in the area had reopened due to the importing of replacement workers, commonly called scabs, while returning strikers were required to sign so-called yellow dog contracts, agreements in which workers pledged not to join a union. A coal company lawyer, S.B. Avis, explained the concerns of management. It is like a servant lives at your house. If the servant leaves your employment, if you discharge him, you ask him to get out of the servant's quarters. It is a question of master and servant. Evicted from their homes, miners set up tent colonies and began a campaign of guerrilla warfare engaging in skirmishes up and down the Tug Fork River. Casualties resulted on both sides. In May, the government declared martial law, but the legislation was unequally enforced. Workers were the primary target, with hundreds arrested and denied habeas corpus rights. When Sid Hatfield was shot, the miners decided that they had had enough. Men along the Little Coal River were the first to militarize, setting up guard posts and patrols. Meanwhile, word of the unlawful executions was spreading. In a matter of days, some 12,000 coal miners took up arms and began planning a march on Logan and Mingo counties. The goal was to free imprisoned workers end martial law, and organize the entire region. Standing in the way was Blair Mountain, a 2,000-foot natural impediment occupied 
by the National Guard. The war was defined by class. Most lower class workers supported the insurrection. In contrast, Logan County Sheriff Don Chaffin made an appeal to business owners. Americans should do their patriotic duty, he claimed, by opposing the workers and preventing mob rule. Chaffin's salary was partly subsidized by the coal companies. The miners wore red bandanas, earning them the nickname Rednecks. It was the largest armed uprising in the United States since the Civil War. Coal company forces were heavily armed with cutting-edge munitions, including machine guns and even planes, which were used to drop homemade chemical weapons and shrapnel bombs on the Redneck Army. At one point, bombers from Maryland were flown in to perform aerial surveillance. Yet despite their superior weaponry and despite their superior tactical position, the National Guard was outnumbered three to one. Equally important, the rebels had extensive knowledge of the terrain. While the guardsmen felled trees and dug trenches, the miners made use of natural pathways, rapidly ascending the mountain. According to archaeologist Harvard Ayers, who made an extensive study of Blair Mountain artifacts, the Redneck Army would almost certainly have won the battle, but the coal companies had a trump card. On September 1st, 1921, President Warren G. Harding sent in federal troops from Fort Thomas, Kentucky. The miners, many of whom had fought in World War I, refused to engage American soldiers. Many even celebrated their arrival, regarding them as comrades in arms but their trust was misplaced. After surrendering, 1,217 indictments were laid down, including 325 for murder and 24 for treason. It is likely that many of the miners would have been executed, but the public was sympathetic to their plight. Of the men convicted, most only served a few years in prison. Bill Blizzard, who was regarded by authorities as the general of the miners' army, was first tried at the Jefferson County Courthouse in Charlestown, the same building in which John Brown had been tried for treason in 1859. Brown had led a failed revolt against the institution of slavery in the United States and was subsequently hanged. Blizzard, though tried several times in several different locations, was eventually acquitted. The West Virginian mine wars were part of a broader conflict between the forces of labor and the forces of capital, a struggle that claimed the lives of thousands of American workers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Thousands more were beaten, maimed, imprisoned, tortured, and sent to early graves due to poor working conditions and dismal safety standards. According to historian Philip Taft, the United States during this time period was home of the bloodiest and most violent labor history of any industrial nation in the world. <laughs>